everyone! In today's video I'm going to be showing you how to make a corset flossing sampler. This is essentially a little test piece of different embroidery designs. Flossing is not at all difficult to do and these are a great way to try out designs before you commit to embroidering a whole corset. I've put this video together more like a class than my usual follow along type video. So there are instructions for a lot of different designs and it's kind of long. <laughs> so in order to make it as useful to you as possible, I have split this up into different sections and there are timestamps for each of them in the description below. This should be particularly useful if there's a specific design that you're interested in learning, though you might want to watch the first one before you start skipping around, just so that you've got all the basics. There's also a PDF, which includes a copy of my finished sampler, so you can use that to take all the measurements that your heart desires, or even to scale it up or down for different size boning channels. And also in the description is a copy of the CoCovid program, as well as some more information about the event, which I'll talk more about at the end of this video. Before I get started on the designs, I'm going to talk briefly about what corset flossing is, and what materials you'll need to do it. I'll talk specifically about different types of embroidery thread and which ones are best suited, and then I'll talk about putting together the sampler base. The designs themselves are split into three sections. Flossing for plastic and steel boning, for cording, and for cane. You'll also be able to find timestamps to each of the individual designs below. So what is corset flossing? It's nothing to do with your teeth. <laughs> corset flossing is a form of embroidery used on corsets, which was particularly popular in the Victorian era. Essentially, it works like this. If a piece of boning is able to move up and down in the boning channel, it eventually creates a weak spot and it can even wear through and create a hole. By securing the boning on either end, it can no longer move around and there's less wear on the fabric. Depending on the design, it might even be adding a whole extra layer to that point. So it's preventing damage, as well as being pretty. Unfortunately, I don't have any Victorian corsets in my collection, so the original examples that I'm going to be showing you are all from the Symington collection. The Symington Corset Company was one of the first and biggest mass manufacturers of corsets in the UK. They were really a leader in this industry in the Victorian era and beyond because they did adapt and keep producing well into the 20th century. The amazing thing is, a whole range of their corsets, samples, patterns, even competitors' corsets are actually still together and form the Symington Collection, which is held by the Leicestershire County Council Museum Service. If the name sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you can actually buy copies of original Victorian corset patterns from them, which have been used by a whole whole range of makers, including a few here on YouTube. They really are an incredible resource, and if you're interested in recreating Victorian corsetry, there's really nothing comparable out there. So before I jump into materials and everything, there's one more really big thing to keep in mind. A lot of the really elaborate flossing designs on surviving corsets were actually sewn by machine. These are boned with cane or reed, which seems to come back into use as corsets start to be mass manufactured. As far as I'm aware, the machines used could only stitch through cane, not whalebone, not steel. The fact that cane becomes more popular is likely to do with cost for the manufacturers, it's cheaper than whalebone or baleen, and the flossing can be sewn by machine, which is quicker, therefore cheaper. It does also seem likely that whalebone is becoming harder to get a hold of at this point. 
thanks industrial revolution but i haven't done enough research to definitively say that one of these is the reason it's likely that there were a range of factors at play here i will be talking about my personal favorites but all you really need for flossing is some form of embroidery thread and a needle and since we're just making a sampler I'd even go so far as to say that the fabric and boning you use aren't that important, since this is never going to be under any stress. It's not going to be worn. Make sure that the fabric you use is sturdy and non-stretch. But other than that, if you want to try this, just have a go with what you've got at home. I do always recommend wearing a thimble for hand sewing. Cotille can be pretty thick. So I think it's especially important for projects like this. I also tend to keep a pair of pliers nearby when I'm hand sewing. You might spot these in the video. This is just a habit I picked up because it's a little easier on my wrists. You can definitely do it without, or you can get one of those needle grabbers, which are like little rubber discs. On the topic of needles, I'm just using these plain ones. I know some people prefer embroidery needles since they have a bigger eye, but honestly, as long as you can get your thread through the end, use whatever you've got. When you're flossing a whole corset, you'll also want something to measure with and something to mark with. This will help you keep all your motifs the same size. If you're just sewing a sampler with one of each design, it's definitely not as important, but I've used easy to follow measurements for my designs in case you'd like to recreate them. I like to use pens that disappear with heat to do my markings, either the Friction brand or the ones from Muji. I know that these can be a little controversial in the costuming community since the marks can reappear if they get too cold, but I haven't had any problems and if I'm marking a corset, I really do use tiny little marks. You could also use chalk or pins if you prefer. The names for different types of thread can vary by location, by company, so I'll start off by saying what I'll be calling each of them to avoid confusion. I'm calling this silk twist. You may also know it as silk buttonhole thread. I'll be calling this embroidery floss. And I'm calling this top stitch thread. You might hear it called buttonhole thread, but I want to avoid confusing it with the silk thread. My favourite thread to use for flossing is silk twist. It's very strong, it has a beautiful sheen to it, and I find that it's the nicest to sew with just because it's so smooth. In my opinion, it's also the closest to the way original flossing looks. Here you can see a Victorian corset on the left, and flossing sewn by me on the right. Silk twist can be harder to get hold of than the other options, and it can be slightly more expensive. I'll be using two different kinds in this video, Guterman Silk Buttonhole Twist and De Vere Silk Embroidery Thread. De Vere does have a few different thicknesses and they have a really great chart on their website to compare them, but if you're using it for flossing, I would recommend the 36 thickness. Anything thinner makes it difficult to space your stitches evenly, and the size up is too thick and it's more loosely twisted, so it gives a different effect. The 36 De Vere yarn is slightly thinner and more tightly twisted than the Guterman ones. You do get a lot more value for money with the De Vere ones. In the 36 thickness, you get 50 meters for about the same cost as 10 meters on one of these. But they are both great options. I do want to quickly mention that the stuff I'm talking about here is thicker than silk sewing thread. You can see the difference here. Embroidery floss is a very popular choice when people are trying flossing for the first time. Most craft stores carry it, so it's easy to find, it's the cheapest on the list, and it comes in 
every colour imaginable, which is perfect if you're trying to match your flossing to your fabric or your trim. It's too thick, so it does need to be split down into a few of the smaller threads. I use two of them. And it does give a different effect. Your designs won't look as crisp as the other options. I've included a few comparisons in my sampler so that you can see the difference. The other downside is it's not very strong. Your boning is a lot more likely to wear through the stitches on this one than it is with the other options. The last option I want to mention is top stitch thread or buttonhole thread or extra strong thread. Again, the name will depend on where you buy it from. This falls somewhere between the other two. It's easier to find than silk twist and a lot stronger than embroidery floss. It doesn't come in quite as many colours as the embroidery floss, but it is generally a bit cheaper than the silk twist. The Guterman top stitch thread in particular is a great one. It's very smooth and doesn't actually look hugely different from their silk version, aside from being slightly less shiny. Other brands can be a little rougher or more fluffy though. For my sampler base, I'm using one layer of cotton cotille and external boning channels made of cotton sateen. I'm using the external boning channels so that it's easier for you to see which side is the front and the back. The boning channels themselves are very simple. They're just straight strips of fabric folded into thirds and machine stitched down. The cording is also very simple. The edges are folded under and it's machine stitched down. And I used a zipper foot to help me stitch close to each of the cords. Again, if you want to make one that's exactly like mine, there is that PDF in the description so you can print it out and take all the measurements you like. Though I will just quickly say mine is 25 centimeters wide and 16 centimeters tall. I've made it this size so that it will fit nicely into an A4 sized picture frame, though I've also included measurements if you'd like to make one that fits into a US letter size, and you just do that by shortening the sides a bit. I have also bound the edges of my sampler, but that's definitely not essential. That's just to help me keep things neat while I'm working. I'm using synthetic whalebone in my sampler, but for the most part, these designs would also work with flat and spiral steels. Synthetic whalebone behaves very similar to real whalebone, and as an added benefit, you can actually punch small holes in it, which I'll be using to imitate the effect of machine sewn flossing. The designs in this section are the ones you are most likely to use on your corsets, since they work with the most commonly used types of boning. Before I start each design, I'll be putting a picture of the finished design up on the screen so that you know what we're working towards. The first design that I'm going to show you is a triangle or teardrop shape, and I'm starting on the lower left corner of my sampler with this double boning channel, and I'm going to be doing the first one on this channel. The reason that I've included these double boning channels is actually to show you the difference between the silk twist thread and the embroidery floss. I've tried to pick colours that are as similar to each other as possible, so that you'll really be able to see side by side in the same design exactly what each of these look like. I will be doing another slightly more complicated one up here later on in the video. Before we can actually start sewing, we need to mark some key points in our design. The very first thing I do is I make sure that the bones are centered in the boning channel so that there is the same amount of space on each side. Then I'm going to go in with my pen again. This is one that disappears with heat and I'm going to mark the base of the bones. So when you're sewing, especially on the first side, the bones have a tendency to shift up and down while you're working, so this just makes it a little bit easier to get all your stitches neat. 
Next, I'm going to be marking the height of this design. This one is going to be two and a half centimeters tall. And I actually just need one measurement for this one. I'm going to be using my stitches as a spacing guide. So I've used a stitch length of 1.5 millimeters and I'm going to be doing stitches going through each of the sewing machine stitches, basically. So on this design, we're going to be starting on this corner here, but we want to secure the thread in the back. So I'm just going to put the needle through. And now I have a small hole here, so I know where I'm aiming for. Now, I don't like to do knots on the back of my flossing. That's, it is totally fine, you can make knots, that's not a problem. I, however, prefer to do one or two small back stitches, so I do try to catch the thread as I go. So, a back stitch going through this thread, that really helps to secure it. Now I take the needle back through to the front of the design, and now I'm going to go to the back of the design at this top marking. Again, like I just mentioned, I will be using the stitches as a guide, so I'm making sure to go between two stitches. Generally, on examples of Victorian flossing, there are not very many big stitches on the back of the design. So in order to avoid this, we're not going to go down here. We're going to come back out one stitch below. We're going to keep this thread parallel to the other one and go through to the back of the fabric at the base. Next, I just repeat those same stitches. I bring the needle from the back to the front of the fabric in line with my marking along the base of the bone and then back up to the top of the design one stitch below my last thread. So now you can see we've come out next to those first two and we're going to go back to the front one more stitch down. Make sure that you're coming up through the stitching so you can see my needle's gone a bit to the side here so I'm just going to make sure that it's all lined up there we go so that's four lines of thread and we're just going to continue like this all the way across the last one is going to follow this line that my needle is showing you here I've just done my last stitch. I don't continue all the way into this corner. That's because I'm going to do a mirrored design on the other side and the finished effect is gonna look like a little heart. So we're just gonna tie this off. You can see on the back that I have a little row of stitches here and a row of stitches here. Again, I'm just gonna do a little back stitch and I've caught this thread with the needle. And then we're just going to hide the tail in the back, come up a little further down, and that's it. Now we trim this end. And that means the first design is finished. For the other half of the boning channel, I'm going to be doing the exact same design, just mirrored, but I'm going to be using the embroidery floss. So you can see how much thicker the embroidery floss is. So we do not want to use the whole thing. I'm going to be using two threads from this. So I just take two and separate it out. And this is now much closer to the thickness of the silk thread. Here you can see the finished design. I actually did a slightly better job of the shaping on this one uh, by starting a little higher up, which I should have done here as well. But if we go close up, hopefully you can see the difference between the two threads. And of course, if we turn it this way up, we have a little heart. On the back, you can see that I've followed the same stitches on the second half as I did the first half. 
and each has a little row along the bottom. Next, I'm going to be showing you a V shape, which is essentially just this section of the design and that section of the design again. So we're going to use the same measurements for this one and we're going to mark the boning channel in the same way. So first I'm going to mark the base and then I'm going to mark the height. Again, we're using the same measurements, so that's two and a half centimeters, but I am just going to mark both sides of the boning channel. I'm going to be using this orange thread for this one. We're going to start this design off exactly like we did the other one. So starting in this corner, And we're going to pull the needle to the front and make our first stitch across to the opposite top corner. One stitch down and to the front. And we're just going to continue across, keeping the threads parallel to each other. We're going to have a total of eight threads crossing over, so that's four trips back and forth. Now that we've done our stitches, we should be nearly at the centre. So I'm just going to go back up, same way I have been doing, and make sure that I'm on the other side of the centre. Then I'm going to repeat the whole thing going in the other direction, just starting from the bottom here and working my way up. And here we have the finished design. So. This one is a variation of this one, and all the designs are more or less a variation of these two. So the back, again, we've got the small stitches that's to help prevent wear against the, against the chemise and the body underneath. Next I'm going to be showing you a variation of this design which does not go on the end of the bone. So it's going to be an X that goes across the middle of the channel here. The reason you might want one of these is if you're making a corset that has lace along the top edge, you would secure the edges of the boning with just a few small back stitches, and then you can do a decorative design at the bottom of the lace. The measurements for the X design are basically going to be the same as the V design, because if you think about it, the only difference is that these threads here are going to extend all the way to the edge. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark one and a half centimeters up from this design. That's going to give us some space at the bottom and two and a half up from that. We're going to be starting our stitching here, and on this one I'm actually going to show you how to do a design that has two different colours. So we're going to start with this darker red thread, and we're going to do two stitches going across. So here we have our two parallel stitches in the red going from the bottom right marking to the top left marking and then back again. Now I want to get the needle over to the other side, but instead of just crossing it over the back, which I have done before and I haven't had any problems, but just to keep with the theme of as few stitches on the inside as possible, we're just going to pass the needle through the fabric and then back out to the other side. And then we're just going to make two more stitches going the other way. This leaves us with an X on the front and just four small stitches on the back along with that one thread which passes under the back of the fabric. So now we're going to fill in the rest of the design with an orange thread which I've gone ahead and tied off on the back behind the needle here. We're starting three stitches below the X and moving our way up, again on the same side, same direction as what we started with. The three stitches is just so that it's the same width as this one down here. So we've done three stitches there, our thread is at the top here, and I'm just going to jump to above the red 
here and do three more stitches. Then I'll do the same thing I did with the red one and I'm going to jump over to the other side on the back and do the same thing going back down the other direction. And there we have it. That gives us this sort of woven effect X, which is a really great complement to this design if you want a decorative version. And again, we've avoided big stitches on the back and we do have two threads passing under the boning channel on the back. This design is a variation on the V shape that we just did, but we're going to play with proportion and we're going to weave the ends together. So instead of having one side underneath and the other side on top, we're going to make them staggered. And we're going to do that by continuing that trick that we learned with this X design here of passing the threads through the back. So we do need a few more measurements for this one. We're starting again by marking the base and then we're going to make some half centimeter marks. Then we're going to do a mark that is three quarters. You can do 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and then one that's one centimeter up. So this gives us an overall height around about three and a half centimeters, a little bit less. I will transfer all these marks to the other side just so it's easier to see. So I'm going to have one stitch going into each of these marks and an extra one between the bottom two. I'm working with a top stitch thread this time and again I've begun by securing the thread on the back on the lower right corner. So I'm going to take this thread and go up to the first mark across the back and back down. I'm not using the stitches as a guide on this one, I'm just using the marks that I've made. And again, we're going to go through the back of the fabric so that we don't have any long tails hanging around. So my last stitch just came from here down to the corner. And before tying it off, I'll just move the needle towards the middle of the channel and do a small back stitch to secure those longer stitches. Now my boning channels are very narrow and these stitches aren't actually that long, so it's not actually that big of a concern. But if you have wider boning channels, this might be a good idea just to keep all those longer stitches in the back together. And that's this design finished. As you can see, all of these are staggered and woven into each other. And by playing with the proportion and the distance between the stitches, we have a very different effect from this one, even though essentially we're not doing a whole lot different. This design is the first one that has a hole in the boning channel. So the bone that's in there looks just like this one and the hole is one and a half centimeters up. The design that I'm doing is going to be three and a half centimeters tall. So first I'm going to mark that hole. I can actually feel that with the pen and I'm going to mark in the center of the boning channel four half centimeter marks. So this one is marking where the hole is and these are for a decorative stem. I'm using another one of the Devere yarns for this one in blue and I'm going to tie off the thread in this corner the way I did before. So essentially what I'm going to do with this design is take the thread into the hole, go from a different angle back through the hole so that's coming back out at the same place and I'm just going to move back and forth doing that. So I'm going to take the thread back down to the base of the bone and I'm just going to work my way across, just up and down. This design can also be done by looping the thread around, which would give the same effect from the front, but it would leave long threads on the back, which is why I've chosen to do it this way instead. 
as I get closer to the end of the design and the hole becomes more full, I do also do a few stitches like this, which go through the threads at the top and through the boning channel. Once I've filled in all the blank spaces, I finish this part of the design by bringing the needle up through the hole so that the thread is on the right side of the fabric. This is what I'm going to use to make the decorative stem. So I'm going to pass that all the way up to my top marking and go through just the top layer of the boning channel and come out at the side there. I'm now going to make the little V's on the stem, like little leaves if you like, and I'm going to take a stitch underneath the top of that stem, but it's going to make a little loop there. I'm going to go back in the other side, all of these stitches now are just through the boning channel, and come back out on the other side in line with that next mark, and I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm doing three of these little V's. Now there are a few different ways to do these. Um, this is my personal favorite because it anchors down this long thread and especially if you're making if you're making it any longer than I've done here it just feels a little bit more secure having something holding them down. So with this last one, I'm just going to go all the way through. Since I'm at the edge of the bone, I can just push straight through to the back and tie that off. And here is the finished design. Again, with the design that passes through the bone, that imitates the machine flossing on cane boning. You could theoretically do a similar effect to this on steel boning if you just did stitches that passed through the boning channel. So with these four or five designs, that's basically everything you need to know about flossing, more or less, and the designs that I'm going to do along the top here are just some variations on those. For the next design, I'm going to create a gradient using these three different shades of blue, and I'm going to be doing it on the other end of the double boning channel. So I'm going to do another V shape, like this one here. I'm going to show a slightly different variation on weaving the ends together, and I'm going to include a stem. The height of this one is going to be three centimeters for the actual V, and then another three centimeters for the stem. So that brings the total height to six centimeters. And like I did with the green one right at the beginning, I'm going to be doing one side in silk and one side in embroidery floss. This design has two threads at a time woven together. So I've started at the top left, three centimeters up, not these measurements up here, which are for the stem. And I'm going to go down to the bottom right, and back up. Now we're going to cross over to the other side of the boning channel, and this is why we've started from the top, because all the crossing over is going to happen up here now, and it's going to be staggered. If we had started at the bottom, then all of it would happen right at the base of the bone, and we'd have a ton of threads there. So same thing, going back the other way. And we're just going to keep doing that. So I'm going to do two sets in dark blue, two in the medium, and one in the lightest blue. The lightest colour I do actually start at the base. That's because I want to end at the base of the bone. So my last stitch of the V design goes in at the base. And then I'm actually going to go back out at the base, making sure not to go through the exact same hole. And then I'm going to push the needle underneath my design. And I want to come back out in the center of the boning channel near the top of my design. I'm then going to do that stem nearly the same way I did the last one. It's going to be facing the other way. So my first stitch is going to go all the way up 
and then the needle's going to come back out at the side which means I'm going to be able to make my next stitch down here and following the same pattern as that other one so needle back in where I finished and out here you can play around with the proportion of these as well so making them taller aligning them in different ways and like with the first one we did the design ends at the edge of the boning channel so I can just pull the thread through to the back and tie it off. So here's what the silk twist version looks like and here it is with the embroidery floss version next to it. So again those were just done exactly the same way. There's quite a few stitches on the back but they are all very small and you can really see the difference I think with this one. The stitches are a lot more defined especially that woven effect in the middle is a lot more clear with the silk twist than it is with the embroidery floss. To create this design I'm going to be using a grey and a black silk thread and I'm going to be using a similar method to this blue one we just finished. Basically what I'm doing is I'm showing you the different effect you can get just by skipping some of these middle stitches. So just sewing the top part of the design and the bottom part of the design. I am using a bone which has a hole in it again, just like the other one. This is one and a half centimeters from the top. This time I'm just going to be using it to make it a little bit easier to sew the stem. So I want this design to be the same height as the other one, three centimeters. And I'm also going to mark one and a half centimeters for the lower part of the design. The stem is going to be a little bit shorter than the last one we did. I'll make one mark at five centimeters and one at four. I'll also mark where that hole is just to give you a little perspective. Once again I've started in the lower right corner and I'm going to be moving up to the top left side of the design. I'm going to be following the same method that I did on the blue one and sewing four threads on each side of this X. The black thread is going to follow the same pattern, so I've started just to the right of the center. I'm going to bring it up, do the loop in the back so that I'm back up one stitch below, back down, over, up, down. This one I will loop around those long grey threads in the back, but I'll just catch those together as I tie this off. I've just done an extra back stitch behind the hole and I'll be taking the needle through to the front. So when I do this I want to make sure that I'm not catching any of the threads. I'll then go up to the top of my design and I'm going to be adding little flowers to these. The order that I do the petals in is not really very important. Um, so I'm just going to the side first here, but basically what you're going to want to do is go from the center out. I'm now going to move down here and I'm going to create two more stems. So I'm going to take this thread down and back into the hole and then coming up from a different angle so it doesn't come undone. Now I'm going to go up here and add the petals to the rest of the flowers. And on the last one, I'm just going to push the needle through to the back and tie it off and we're finished. And here's the finished design from the front and from the back. This design is going to be another gradient, but in shades of pink this time. This is one that I've actually used on a whole corset, so I'll put an image of that up on the screen for you. Something to keep in mind with this is that there's relatively few stitches holding the end of the bone in place. 
So if you're trying to make something that's really hard wearing, that might be something to keep in mind. Essentially, this design is really similar to the X shape that we did at the beginning, except we're going to spread out one end of the stitches and we're going to weave the ends together like we did with this brown one. This one's going to be four centimeters tall. We're going to mark half a centimeter up from the base, that's where the X is going to start, and the very top where the design will finish. I'm starting with my dark red color tied off at the back at the half centimeter mark. I'm going to take that down right to the center of the base of the channel and do the same thing that I was doing making these flowers. Next I want to come back out of the same hole so I'm just going to take a diagonal stitch from the back and finish off the lower part of the design. I did actually make a mistake marking this one, sorry about that. I should have marked this point here, which is about two centimeters up from the base. What I actually did is counted down 15 stitches, so I know that all my stitches will fall between these two marks, but two centimeters and just working your way up, that would work as well. So my thread is here right now at the back. And I want to come back out through the same hole, so again I'm just going from an angle so that I don't pull it straight back out. Now I'll go up to that mark I just made, and the top part of my silk thread flossing stitches are going to be spaced three machine stitches apart. So what I'm going to do is come back up three stitches above, and then back down close to where I was. I'm going to pass the thread behind the back again through that top layer of fabric and come back out through the same stitch. So depending on how you want your threads to be woven, you could just go over the top and then they'll be in pairs the way they were with this blue design. I actually want them to be individual, if that makes sense, so not in pairs. So every time I cross over a V in the second direction, with my first stitch, I'm going to go under the uppermost thread. If that feels too complicated, it is absolutely fine to have them staggered in pairs, or to do one side at a time. All of it fine, these are not like hard fast rules. I'm just trying to show some variation. So we're going to go up three stitches again and back down. I'll tie this one off and then I'll do the next two colors exactly the same way. Here you can see the finished design. The back has much longer vertical stitches along the boning channel because we spaced these out a lot further than any of the other designs. This one would also work really well as a decorative design, so like this X, just by leaving off the bottom part of the design. And you can see what it looks like with and without, and they would be facing into each other like this if you use them on a corset. So this would be at the top with some lace here. I thought it would be nice to finish off with a slightly more simple design. So this is the basic one that I will use if I want a bit of flossing on a corset but I don't want to do something really decorative. So all I'm doing is marking the base of the bone and one centimeter up. I'm using a brown silk thread for this one and I've just started at the back the way I've been doing a back stitch to hold everything in place and I'm coming to the front just left of the center at the base of the bone and then I'm just going to go up to the right and just do a basic V design with two threads on each side. And that's it for this design. I'll just finish off with another back stitch. So that's the finished design. The ends do cross over each other just ever so slightly. Uh, typically if I'm doing this I will use a thread that matches pretty well um, if I don't really want it to be on show. 
Flossing on cording doesn't really serve a practical function. It's much more decorative. The cording is soft, so it moves with the fabric, and it's not going to wear a hole through your boning channels. But if you're making a corset with cording, you might still want those sections to be embellished. So I'm going to be showing you three different designs to do that. All three of the cording designs are going to be variations on this basic zigzag shape. So to make this easy to mark, I'm actually using my pattern master and I'm going to mark parallel lines two centimeters apart. I start my thread off with a back stitch on the back of the piece like before and then I take it across one cording channel and back through. I want to come back out at the same spot, so I'm going to be doing that same trick of coming at it from an angle so that I'm catching some of the threads from the back that way, and I'll just continue across like that. Here you can see the finished design. We have the long stitches across the front of the sampler and just tiny little stitches along the back. An easy way to make this design a little bit more exciting is to add another colour in the gaps, which gives you an effect like this. For the next design, I'm going to be following the same basic technique, but I'm going to offset the zigzag rows. So I want the height of the zigzags to be one and a half centimeters, and I'm actually going to mark between these as well, because I only want to offset them by half, if that makes sense. I want to do four rows of zigzags, so I need six rows of markings and these are three quarters of a centimeter apart each. So I'm starting with my darkest red color in one of the corners. The next stitch I'm going to go up and over a cording channel. I'm going to ignore this row and go into the row that's one and a half centimeters away. And I will just continue this row the same as I did these up here. Then, with my next colour, I'm going to sew another zigzag going in the other direction between this line and this line. After that, it's just continuing the same pattern with the third colour and with the fourth colour. And here we have the finished design. Like with the first one we did, this one also just has little stitches in the back. For the last variation, I'm going to do a slightly thicker but shorter zigzag. So again, I'm starting in the lower left corner. These lines are one centimeter apart. And I'm going to go up and across one cording channel. Then I'll move up one stitch the way I was doing on a lot of these designs, and go back to the beginning. Again, that's one up from where we started, and do that one more time. That gives us three parallel stitches. Now I'm going to flip it to the back and go back to the first stitch I made on this channel. Then I'll continue down this way, doing the same thing. To the right, back to the left, and to the right again. Since I'm doing an odd number of stitches, my needle is ending to the opposite side of each of these lines as it began, so that will enable me to move all the way across. You can see that these have the one longer stitch where I went from the top to the bottom. And here we have the final design. Like I mentioned earlier, corsets would have been boned with cane when the flossing was sewn by machine. And you can actually see the bobbin threads on the back when this has been done. We've already talked about using decorative stitching and holes in synthetic whalebone to recreate the effect, 
but I wanted to include some cane in this video as well, just to show you what it's like. I have not seen any examples to suggest that people were sewing through cane by hand, so keep in mind that this is purely experimentation on my part. This is the cane, the type of boning that I have in my last two boning channels. It's very, very lightweight and it is very bendy. I imagine it's slightly more likely to snap than the synthetic whale bone, but if you bend your bones to the right shape before you wear the corset, I don't imagine you'd have any problems. The first design that I'm going to be doing on the cane is going to be a copy of this one we did earlier. This had a hole in the synthetic whalebone, so we're going to try that again, but of course without the hole, and we're just going to sew straight through the cane. So we're marking in the same way. That design was three centimeters tall, with a mark at one and a half centimeters, and another mark at five and at four. I should really hold the ruler the other way around and it would be less confusing. <laughs> I'm sewing this one in two different shades of orange, just to mix things up a little bit, but other than that it is exactly the same as the black and grey design, so I am just going to breeze through this bit, and then I'll check back in when I'm ready to sew through the bone. Like with the black and grey one, I've just done a little back stitch to hold these longer threads in place, and then I'm going to travel the needle through the back of the fabric close to that 1.5 centimeter mark. I use my needle to make a small guide hole so I can see the point I'm aiming for from the back, and then pass the needle and thread from the back to the front of the fabric. Through the bone, that wasn't difficult to do. I go up to my top marking to make the first stem and go through all the layers to the back of the fabric. I stitch one petal, then travel the needle through the boning channel to the top of the next stem. Again, I stitch one petal to get back to the right side of the fabric and then go back to the base. I come back up through the same point and sew my last stem. I am sewing these essentially the same way I was doing before, only I'm going all the way through the bone with each stitch, rather than taking a little loop of just the boning channel. To tie this one off, I can just go through the bone wherever my last stitch was and tie it off here. So here is the finished orange flower design compared to the black and grey one. I think I made the flowers a little bit smaller this time, that wasn't intentional. And if we look at the back, you can see that the orange flowers went through to the back and the bone is secured in all these places as well. So for this one, I thought I would do another variation on the floral little flowers design. So I'm going to make one mark which is four centimeters up, another which is three centimeters up, and another which is one and a half centimeters up. That's all measured from the base of the bone. I'm starting off with a green thread. I don't actually want the threads at the bottom of this design to cross over each other, so most of the designs we've done have had that sort of X pattern. This one I want them to all be in a row. So I've started maybe three quarters of the way across and I'm going to go up to the first mark that's on the same side. And then I just use that same back and forth motion that I've been using on the other designs. I sew the flowers through all the layers, just like in the orange design. And here is the finished design. From the back you can see, again, all of these flowers have gone through all the layers, the boning, the fabric, the boning channel, and that bone is very secure in the channel because it's stitched in so many places. So I figured for this design we would do yet another flower, because that seems to be what everyone wants to see. So for this one I've marked three centimeters, a centimeter and a half, 
and half a centimeter. I'm actually going to draw out the top of the flower to help me keep my stitches even. I start at the base and make a stitch at my first marking. Then I go back up through the same hole and add a V design with spaced out stitches using my 1.5 centimeter mark as a guide for the top. And then I make a final stitch to the base of the flower and I'll tie off this color at the back. I will tie off my blue thread for the petals at the same point and bring the needle through to the front of the fabric. Essentially what I'm going to do with this is work in a zigzag around the flower. I will actually mark the center so I want all my stitches with the blue thread to end along that line. And here is the finished design. It's definitely pretty different from the rest, but I think it does add a nice bit of variety to the sampler. You can see that there's quite a few stitches going through the bone at the back. I think if I was going to put this in a corset, I would be a little bit worried that it would weaken the bone at this point. Though the original ones did have that many stitches through the bones as well, the ones that were sewn by machine, so it might be worth testing out in a corset one day. The last design on my sampler is going to be a feather. There's a corset with feather flossing in the Symington collection, which seems to be very well liked. So I thought I would try to make a hand sewn version of that design. The height of the design is going to be three and a half centimeters. I'm also going to mark one and a half centimeters from the base, as well as 0.75 centimeters from the base. I'm actually going to do something a little bit different for this design to help me keep the feather even. So I'm going to machine sew a line from this bottom mark up to, not quite up to the top, but nearly. And I'm going to use the same stitch length and this will just help me to space the sections of the feather more evenly. I'm using a black silk thread for this one and I've started off behind the base of the machine stitching. I'm now going down and then I will come back out at the same spot and sew a V with two threads on each side. I don't want to go quite up to the mark, I'm just going to go two stitches below that. I also want to add two stitches extending down and back where I started. I use that next mark as a guide and I'm going to be spacing these two stitches apart. So I'll go up two stitches and back down to the center and I just continue in that zigzag pattern. So I skip two stitches each time. So now my thread is coming up at the top of my machine stitching. I'm going to create the curved top of the feather. I'll just mark that in so it's a little bit easier to see. I've come up quite a bit higher than the top of my design that I had marked. Obviously, if you are embroidering a whole corset with this, you would want to be more careful to follow your measurements to make sure they're all the same. So I've made another stitch that follows that line and now I want to bring the needle through to the center Once I complete the sides of the feather, I'm just going to bring my thread back down to the base. It might end up at the base, depending on how many of the diagonal lines you've done. And I'm just going to add two long lines over the center. And here's the finished design from the front and from the back. As you can see, all that machine stitching that we did got covered up. You could, of course, if you wanted to do a design like this, but you're not using cane, you could use this technique that we did earlier, and you could definitely have a similar effect just by stitching over the top of the boning channel. 
And here is the finished flossing sampler. I'll be using one of these designs to floss a history bounding corset in my next video, so if you're curious to see how that turns out, stay tuned. And this is what the back looks like. Remember that if you want to see any of these closer up, there are timestamps to each of the designs in the description. Okay, if you've made it to the end of that, I'm seriously impressed. <laughs> Like I mentioned earlier, this video is my contribution to CoCoVid, so if you enjoyed it, definitely have a look at the schedule in the description because there are a ton of videos in the event. And if you're watching as part of the event, I will put my badge code on the screen now. And if you'd like to have a go at flossing, I'm actually doing a giveaway of a blank version of my sampler and two spools of silk thread. All the details on how to enter are on my Instagram. I haven't figured YouTube out yet. Sorry. <laughs> my account is Lena Piprek, same as here, and I'll put a link in the description as well. There's so much in the description today. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.